So welcome everyone to Researcher's Desk. It's a great pleasure today to present Paula Richter. Paula is from the Climate Psychologists um, and she's going to talk to us uh, today about climate psychology and it's, uh, um, we're all super interested and looking forward to your presentation. Paula, I'm going to turn my own video off, um, but I'm going to be here and if there's any technical things, my video will suddenly turn on again <laughs> and I'll be here helping you out. So warm welcome to Researcher's Desk. It's lovely having you here with us, uh, with a huge audience here today. So uh, warm welcome. Uh, the uh, stage is now yours. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen, screen right now? We see it and we can hear you. It's all good. Very good. Thank you. So I'm Paula Richter and uh, I'm a specialist psychologist and I'm going to talk to you about how can climate psychology be of help in the ecological crisis. And today I'm speaking in English or at least trying to. And uh, if you're not really comfortable with that, I also have a Swedish talk made, I think, almost two and a half years ago on the researcher's desk's uh, YouTube channel. So you can go there and hear more. And uh, I am part of the climate psychologists in Sweden, Klimatpsykologerna, and we have this newsletter for free, Climate Psych, if you want to know more, it's in English. And we also have a project right now called Terra Pi, I think it's the pronunciation in English, and it's a bit more funny in Swedish because it's Terra Pi. Uh, and uh, it's uh, we got funded by the Swedish Inheritance Fund uh, because we wanted to share our knowledge and uh, it is uh, the, the project it, it exists to support young people with echo anxiety and of course adults are also supported in the same ways as young people even if young people are more affected usually and that made us uh, made us gave us a possibility to, to flow through the research which is growing which is nice now the climate psychology research and we have created models and exercises and it's all for free and you can find it on therapy.se and uh, psychology is the knowledge of emotions and thoughts and behaviors. And climate psychology deals with how these emotions and thoughts and behaviors has created and still maintain, maintains the climate and ecosystem crisis and how these inherent human traits can be used to handle the crisis but also how our emotions and thoughts and feelings and behaviors are affected by the crisis. And many people think that psychologists only deal with individual issues. And of course, there are a lot of individual issues around uh, the ecosystems crisis and the climate change. For instance, there is more of anxiety and depression and PTSD and suicide and aggression and also gender based violence coming with a, a climate crisis. But we're also, uh, since, since everybody, uh, even in, in the hierarchic structures, in, even in the higher, highest levels are human beings, all decision makers are human beings. So we're also working a lot with companies and organizations and authorities uh, to see how they can um, have a better effect in their uh, climate work. And we all have brains and uh, all of our brains are wired in the same ways as when we were hunters and gatherers, which means they have a lot of flaws that we can see in modern life. There was a reason for these cognitive biases when they were made, that's why we survived. But nowadays they hinder us a, a lot and they also, they can, yeah, they can hinder us a lot when we try to do the best we can in the climate crisis. And cognitive, this is a, a picture of cognitive bias codex. Uh, and I know you can't see all the small texts, uh, but uh, cognitive biases, they are like thought traps. Uh, biases are something that makes us think in a wrong way. For instance, we have confirmation bias that many of you probably have heard about. And that is that what we already think and know is what we give our attention to. So we get validated in our opinions instead of getting them scrutinized. 
Uh, and this actually affects researchers and academics even more than others. And another thought trap or cognitive bias that is very obvious in climate work is not to count on the effect of a decision. So instead, you take decisions that are often symbolic, like the EU when they banned plastic straws, even if plastic straws was a very small part of the plastic problem. Uh, because, and this is because, as I said, decision makers uh, are also human beings and they also have these flawed brains. So we, we as climate psychologists, we try to help companies and organizations and authorities to focus on the effect that their decisions have instead of what makes them feel good to decide. And large scale and long term effects are what is needed. So that's the, what we work with. And this is a model uh, that Elise Amel, a psychology professor in, in uh, I think, US or Canada, has, uh, together with her team, come to uh, during their studies. And uh, it has to do with how you can make your impact larger. So we are all in these different spheres. If we start with a private sphere, you can walk or bike instead of taking your car, or you can donate money to good things, or you can reduce and reuse your uh, instead of consuming. But I think the most important thing here is actually for Swedes to look at where is your money right now, because um, we most Swedes have uh, more money than we need in the very situation right now. And uh, we have like pension funds and banks that are investing in fossil fuels. So uh, we can easily find out through Fair Finance Guide on the internet, for instance, how to um, see to that our money goes to better things or not, does not go to things that are actually uh, destroying our climate systems and the balance of the earth. And on the next level, you see the social network, that is your family and your friends, and you can teach people what you know, and you can support others going through coming to become more climate active. But you can also take the lead. One of the things that climate psychology studies show is that we need uh, examples, good examples. We need to see that other one, uh, there are people living in a good life without emitting too much, for instance. So we need good examples to know where to go. And the next uh, level is uh, the organizational level. Uh, that is your company or your organization. And w there we can share ideas, but we can also see too that our companies change processes so that we do emit less, for instance. We need the individual to take the steps to make the organizations change their processes. So we, as I say, we need, need all these levels. And there is a public sphere that is the next sphere. And there you, you we have the political parties, for instance, and uh, the unions. And uh, we can protest. We have climate activists on the public uh, level. And we can organize. And there, in this level, we, we create the laws. And I know many of you are also working with creating new laws that will uh, change our way of behaving towards the nature. And the biggest or the most encompassing uh, level is the uh, cultural level, uh, where we can work to change norms we can work to change systems and and change the story or the narrative of what is a human being to be a human being is that to be egoistic and want more and more all the time and uh, eternal growth or is is actually to be someone who cares about other others i mean we are developed as an herd animal. So I think this neoliberalistic perspective of us being greedy is not absolutely the best way to describe a human being. And, and we need to re-describe uh, the story, the narrative of what a human being is. In all of these levels, we, we are in different 
parts of them, we're not in one level only, we are in different ones of them, but the further you get out on these spheres, the larger impact you have in what you do. So I can have an, an example would be if I want to start a compost because I don't want to throw away my biodegradable um, waste. So I can either start to have my own bukashi bucket on my uh, balcony, or I can talk to my neighbors and my friends and my family, and we can together start a bigger compost so that more people than me start composting. Or I can go to my my uh, company and say, we, we should have a compost in my company. Uh, we should together work for not wasting our biodegradables. Or I can go to my local authority and I can ask them that we need to have um, compost that will encompass all of, of uh, my city or whatever, or or Sweden. <laughs> we, we need to have compost that will uh, all of Sweden's inhabitants can, can use. So by going from my private sphere to a uh, bigger sphere, I will have a much larger impact on what I do, even whatever I do, it will get a larger impact. And in eventually, we, I will also change the norms. We, we can become, Swedes can become people that do not waste our biodegradables, instead we compost them by doing it in this way. And I think also Researcher's Desk is a good way of, of uh, seeing that organization gets a larger impact. We share knowledge with each other, we connect the dots and we organize, uh, which gives both more effect in what we're doing, but it also gives psychological resilience because when we do things together with others, it's easier for us psychologically. It gets nicer for us. And it's also good to know that changing the system <clears throat> is more effective, effective than changing individuals. Sorry. So the question is, what is needed in our society? And one thing that uh, a psychologist in the US, Margaret Klein Solomon says, is we need crisis awareness. We need to get into emergency mode. And uh, that is because when we are aware that there is a crisis, we are so much better on focusing to solve problems than when we're not aware of, of it being a crisis. So for instance, uh, you might have heard of something called flow. That is when you by yourself are doing something that is really important to you and that you really like to do, and you're forgetting about time, you're forgetting to eat and to rest and maybe to go to the toilet, because you're just into doing what you're doing. And that is a quite wonderful place to be. But this is also something somewhere where society can be, so we can do this together. And that will make us forget about all these things that takes a lot of our time. For instance, we think about our uh, appearance, how do I look? What do these people think of me? We we, we have a lot of thoughts uh, about things that are really trivial, that takes a lot of our time. But if we instead work in crisis awareness, in emergency mode, we will put all our efforts and all our energy into solving the crisis. And we will get to uh, uh, solutions that none of us have thought about before. Because when we, when we go together and solve uh, problems. We're really good at it as human beings. But how do we get people into crisis awareness? Well, one way is to going into this emergency mode yourself. Because if you want people to act in a specific way, you also need to act in that way because people won't listen to you otherwise. And that is the reason why you can't fly to climate conferences, for instance. And also to communicate the emergency as clear as possible. And this probably means for most of us to go outside of our comfort zone, which is scary, but which is also needed for us. And if we don't go out of our comfort zone, we, we also, we aren't evolving. We aren't developing if we don't want to, or, or if we, we, we don't leave our comfort zone. So that's one effort we need to do. But we also need to 
create a plausible path towards solving the crisis. We need to show people how to contribute. We need to show people where to go because as human beings, we don't want to go away from bad things. We want to go towards good things. So we need to find visions of what would a, a, a world, a sustainable world be. And this is also why we uh, academics and researchers need the artists because they are better than most of us to, to create visions. And if you uh, want to get people into crisis awareness, you also need to be aware of climate emotions um, because uh, emotions can hinder us, uh, just like these cognitive biases can hinder us. And this is the climate emotions wheel that uh, is created by a uh, Finnish uh, psychologist researcher, uh, Pano Pikala and his, his team. And uh, as you can see, a lot of emotions are, climate emotions are not, some of them are uncomfortable for us to feel, but a lot of them are also nice or positive emotions like interest or inspiration, motivation and so on. So we we need to, if we are going to get effect into our climate work, we also need to think about and talk about our feelings. For instance, I think many of us feel grief and also shame, and we have a lot of uh, feelings that are entwined into each other. And if we don't talk about them, they can make us not act. For instance, if we feel shame because we are privileged in Sweden, maybe we try to uh, shut our eyes and not see uh, what our privileges make to the world. Or if we have grief and we don't share it with others, then we will be uh, probably more passive uh, because when we are dealing with difficult emotions as human beings we need to we need to share our feelings because that's how we can get through them feelings are signals and they are signals that you need to do something you need to change so we shouldn't see feelings as something negative we should see them as something telling us something so maybe they are uncomfortable, uncomfortable, but they're not negative. They're just signals telling you, you need to change your ways. That's why you're feeling this way. So I'll see what we have next. Um, so if you're not already engaged, or even if you are engaged in something, this climate ikigai can be of help for you uh, because many of us who are working in the climate uh, issues, working uh, with the climate issues, we get uh, exhausted because there's so much to do and uh, and we, we can't do everything that's needed to be done. So in the therapy, our project, uh, we, we usually talk about this ikigai and that is to find what you, what you are going to do in between what brings you joy what is the work that, work that needs to be done and what are you good at? Because if we, if we focus on what brings us joy and what we are good at in the realm of what needs to be done, we can both be more effective, but we can also be more sustainable with ourselves because uh, it, it makes us happy to do those things and we're good at them, so we do it faster. Uh, so this is a good tool uh, for organizations. And I also wanted to give you a recipe to cope with climate anxiety. We need action. Uh, activity gives you well-being. So doing nothing and just seeing how bad it is, it's going to make you feel really bad. But doing things together with others, that gives you also social support. If you organize together with others, you can take care of your own feelings as, at the same time as you're taking care of the planet. So no one will, will no one else will fix this complex threat, but together we can do a lot of things. And also by doing th things together with others, 
you create hope and meaning together with them because hope is nothing that you can just get from someone. Hope is something you need to do. Hope is actually a verb rather than anything else. And that is also what we need. We need hope and we need meaningfulness with what we're doing. Uh, and to accept your feelings. Don't try to fight your feelings because you won't win that fight. In instead, just accept them. Try to give yourself a little pause and just think, focus on your feelings and let, let them tell you what you need to do. And this is as my final thing for today before questions. Uh, this is something I would like us to do. Just it's a very short, brief mindfulness exercise. And if you don't like mindfulness, just sit and relax because that's good for you too. But the rest of us, maybe we can close our eyes if that feels comfortable for us and uh, focus on your breathing. So try to exhale a long time. So you breathe in and then you exhale for a long time. If you have the possibility, please straighten your back and feel your feet on the ground and exhale, long exhales. This is called biofeedback, to breathe for, with, with long breaths will make your brain aware that it's not in a risk, in a threat right now. So it's a good thing to do when you feel activated or if you um, are stressed, just to sit down for a little while and breathe and exhale for a long time. And now I would like you to think about something concerning climate or ecosystem, not, not a big catastrophic thing because we're not gonna make panic here, just something small, something that arouses a feeling inside of you. And if you have a problem with emotions, just focus on your thoughts about climate and ecosystems instead. So don't forget to breathe, long exhales, and think about something concerning climate, ecosystem, something that might stir up some small feeling, and if so, you can focus on that feeling. Just observe what comes in your mind. Don't judge yourself. Don't value your observations. Just focus on your thoughts or feelings with something that comes with climate and ecosystems. And if you now have some feeling or some thought about climate, without moving, try to see if there is something, some activity inside of you that is awakened, some action you would like to take. So don't move, just observe. If your body wants to get activated somehow concerning your feelings or thoughts about climate.
And whatever you feel or think, don't judge it. Just observe it like you would with the weather. Maybe it's raining. Maybe it's storming. Maybe it's sunshine. Just observe what your body wants to get activated in when you think about or feel something around climate and ecosystems. Just focus on your sensations. And see if your body tells you something it wants to do. And coming back from this exercise, um, please open your eyes if they were shut when that feels appropriate for you. I would be grateful if we could make a chat rain and that is to write in the chat what we just experienced and you should of course only share what feels okay with you to share so please go to the chat and write something that you felt or that you thought something that this exercise did with you and if nothing, that's okay too. Mindfulness is always okay with anything that arises or not arises inside of us. And the nice thing with chat rains is that we are sharing our experiences and our feelings. So we can all read what we are writing in the chat. And as some of you do, uh, place a heart so that we share that we are sharing our experiences. We see, for instance, disappointment, fear of rejection about communicating to friends about the climate crisis, or calm focus, or sunshine, green, acceptance, and inner conflict. If I accept things as they are, uh, that's a question, I think. Um, so I will get back to that. The urgency and need to radically change my way of life as a response to be to the inf unfolding breakdown of our societal societal support systems. And I felt a bit overwhelmed and wanted most of all just to lay down on my balcony and rest. I believe it's because I've been in climate action mode for over five years now. Yes, we do need rest. Uh, also, as climate activists we need to to give ourselves permission to to just rest to take some pause sometimes because otherwise we won't be able to continue working with the climate so we need to give ourselves the possibility to to just rest and we have sorrow and we have anger that we are again failing to protect the Baltic herring and anger to people that they don't act and that we do too little too late. 
I felt calm from the micro meditation, but also frustrated and stressed over everything that popped up in my head. I think we all recognize many of these. I'm thinking that we need to increase the biomass on Earth in all possible ways, forest, fishing, biodiversity, indoor plants. Should it be possible with 8 billion people to capture the carbon into solid again? Yes. The feeling of being a dystopian optimist. <laughs> a tool to use to help myself and others. I feel impatient. That's good too. Because we do also need impatience. We're not doing enough, enough, fast enough. And wonderful to do this exercise together. <clears throat> I got energy by focusing on local action in my muni municipality. That's nice. The planet is so beautiful. There is so much beauty in human beings. Anger over the huge amount of inaction and grief that children will have to deal with this world. How important it is to act together. I'm sorry about the mistakes we made in the past that makes the situation so much worse now. Grief, slowly learning to appreciate this emotion. Frustration, but ended up focusing on the sounds that the lake I do. Oh, I like that. Now, Eastern Kunga, when the lake ice sinks during really cold nights, standing beside the lake, listening, feeling the cold, stars in the black sky. The recent setbacks are overwhelming for the effects it will have on society as a whole, but also personally, where to go. At the same time, this weird general curiosity for human actions and inactions, I can agree to that. So I feel um, happy in a way to live in these times because I'm really curious, will we make this or will we not? I, I want to live in these times, even if it's hard. So we have a lot of um, reactions here. Uh, people drive cars and motorways, and this is too heavy on our planet. People don't take responsibility. They don't feel responsible for their actions. Frustration and anger at our numbskull political, political and business leaders who deny that there is a problem, motivated to continue doing what I do and looking for ways to do it more effectively. Despair. We need to collect our efforts, resources to climate and environmental issues, not wars. Yes. Arrive immediately in the red area, area of feelings. After a lecture yesterday at the Resilience Center, you have just read Limits to Growth, MIT from 1972, about the impossibility with continuous growth on a finite planet. But at the lecture, we were told that using the word degrowth was not clever or useful. My frustration sadly arrived today. It's not sadly, though, because we do need to have some time sometimes to get to our feelings. And we relate to each other's uh, like weird curiosity about human action and inaction, conflict between my impatience, frustration with people's choices versus conflict anxiety. Good. I also feel like a dystopian optimist. Thank you. We will uh, end the um, lect lecture on this, uh, so we should take off the recording and uh, 